I want to know what his connections are. Like, wh why is the FBI involved with helping people come to my door and harass me? Some Glendale residents turn to the problem solvers to help get answers after the FBI asks local police to drop charges against a fake private investigator accused of harassing them. The citizens say the phony private eye showed up at their doors intimidating and threatening them over public comments they made about a proposed development. Then the FBI got involved not to help the local police but to make sure the suspect was set free. The victims want to know why. They asked the problem solvers for help. And problem solver Julie Hayden's live with a story you'll see only on Fox 31 Denver. Julie? Well, Jeremy, the citizen said it didn't make any sense when the phony private investigator said he was investigating them because of the public comments. And they say it's even more of a mystery as to why the FBI is defending the suspect at the expense of the victims. It's a little unnerving. Yeah, absolutely. Glendale resident Douglas Stiff says he has every right to express his opinion in the local newspaper, and he couldn't believe it when this man, Charles Johnson, showed up at his door saying he was investigating Stiff because of what he said. He wouldn't disclose who he worked for, and he wouldn't ask, tell me why he was interested. Stiff's opinions have been quoted in the Glendale Cherry Creek Chronicle. The paper has done a series of articles about a Persian rug store owner's proposal to build a skyscraper apartment complex at Colorado and Virginia. Several other citizens have also been quoted speaking out against the idea, and like Stiff, they complained to police when Johnson knocked on their door. One told police he felt, quote, threatened, annoyed, and uncomfortable when Johnson showed up at his work, and that Johnson, quote, got very aggressive and confrontational. According to police reports, when Glendale officers contacted Johnson, he had three separate IDs from three different states and listed an address that turned out to be a post office box in Nashville. Glendale police arrested him for failure to have a Colorado private investigator's license, a misdemeanor. That's bizarre. Um, at that point, I want to know what's going on. Johnson won't say who he's working for, but the FBI told local law enforcement to drop the criminal case. Problem solvers obtained this letter from the special agent in charge of the Denver FBI asking the Arapahoe County District Attorney's Office to dismiss the case, quote, for reasons that cannot be disclosed. Johnson's victims say that's not right. It's concerning that there are people running around operating illegally, coming to my front door, and when, when their actions come to light and uh, they're arrested for what they're doing, uh, seemingly, they can get a get-out-of-jail card from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Problem solvers ask the FBI about Johnson and why they want him free. The FBI response, no comment. And there is another twist. Problem solvers also learned that the FBI contacted the citizens, asking them why they complained to police and asking them about the public comments. We asked the FBI about that, and they said, once again, no comment. Julie Hayden, Fox 31 Denver. We'll try to keep getting answers there. Thanks, Julie. Rose, Chuck Bonnewell, my colleague and my good friend in studio. Uh, Steve Barry coming up on The Lost Order. In the meantime, please say good morning and welcome to 710 KNUS with Chuck in studio. Trevor Aronson is with us, who did a piece entitled How an Undercover FBI Agent Ended Up in Jail After Pretending to Be a Journalist. So first of all, Trevor, good morning to you and welcome back to 710 KNUS. Good morning. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, Chuck is with us in the studio. Aaron, would you quick, or rather do a quick bio so people understand who you are and then how you got onto this story? Of course. So I, um, I'm a journalist who focuses mainly on um, the intersection of uh, civil liberties and national security with a particular focus on, on the FBI. And for the last few years, I've been writing for, for The Intercept. And so this story comes out of a, of a, of a series of stories involving or, Two stories, really, that were published um, earlier this week in the Intercept. And your where you went to school, where you grew up, and then talk about the Intercept as well. Oh, of course. So I um, I'm actually a Florida native, and uh, um, I went to school uh, in Florida, and I was also um, an investigative reporting fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I um, you know I, I wrote a book in 2013 about the FBI's counterterrorism program mm -hmm. involving. Um, its use of informants oh, and yeah. counterterrorism things. And um, since The Intercept was founded, I've been working with them on their national security coverage. The Intercept was founded um, in response to Edward Snowden's leaks, and, and it's funded by Sierra Mediar, the, the founder of eBay. Um, at first, The Intercept was focused primarily on the Snowden leaks and the Snowden files, and has since expanded its, its focus on um, you know civil liberties and national security with a kind of wider glance at 
uh, malfeasance of government mm. and, and business. I'm a huge, before Chuck jumps in, the entire manufacturing of a war that was done by Bush Cheney with the CIA and the FBI is, there should, pe- there should be trials, there should be people in jail for what they did. I've never read you before, Trevor, so I'm guessing perhaps we share that view. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously there are, there are huge concerns about you know the manufacturing of evidence to support you know the war in in Iraq. Um, my my research has has mainly been focused on the FBI's domestic counterterrorism program, where you know in the hunt for terrorists, they're they're not so much finding um, truly dangerous people with with bombs in their garage, but instead they're finding you know mentally ill people or people who can be manipulated in some way. And through these very aggressive sting operations, um, they provide everything that someone needs for Absolutely. for an attack. Well, and then, then prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. Yeah. And, and what this effectively does is really exaggerate the threat of terrorism from within the United States. Yeah. I mean, obviously terrorism is a real threat, but it's not um, nearly the exaggerated and, threat that the FBI has created yeah. Yeah. through these very tactics. Yeah, Chuck, if you would, Chuck. Sure. Identify when we speak. Yeah, sure. This is Chuck Bonniewell. I've read Trevor's book, Inside the Terror Factory, The Manufacturing of, of uh, War and Terrorism. And it's great. You, you need to read it if you want to understand. Yeah. If you want to understand how the FBI works, how this war on terrorism works, it's a must read. It's oh. an absolute must read. Just as we go back in time, uh, I am no fan. I mean, I absolutely. There's moments with the CIA that I see they're the most destructive force in the world, and the FBI oftentimes just breaks the surface and shows its true self as well. And it's both very, very frightening how they've been used in mis- when We were talking about Nixon earlier. But come to this. Trevor, how did you get on to this Glendale story? We kinda, I kind of lived some of it. But how did you get on to the Glendale story? So it started, my, my, my colleague uh, Ryan Devereaux and I were able to obtain the, the footage that, that, the, that the FBI had produced while posing as a documentary film crew um, in, the, in the investigation of Clive and Bundy in Nevada, who... I'm sure like you and most of your listeners know Cliven was the man who um, had an armed standoff with the Bureau of Land Management over um, the confiscation of his cattle due to unpaid grazing fees that that Cliven alleged that he he was not obligated to pay. And so after the armed standoff, um, just for some context, the the BLM ended up withdrawing its contract cowboys and its armed agents as a result of, you know, dozens of people from around the country – hearing about Cliven's armed stand with the government and, and coming there armed themselves. And so the government, concerned about the possibility that dozens of people could die in an armed standoff, ended up um, withdrawing altogether. And following that withdrawal, the FBI was trying to build a case against Cliven and Bundy and, and his supporters. And so what they did, because they were coming at this investigation after most of the um, – possible criminal activity had occurred, um, decided that what they would do would, would be posed as um, independent filmmakers or a documentary film crew. And they spent nearly a year um, traveling through more than five different states, interviewing people who had um, been at the Bundy Ranch, um, interviewing the, the Bundy um, patriarch Cliven and his brothers, excuse me, and his sons and his, and his wife, and, um, you know, produced all of this footage with the intent of being um, to create, you know, evidence of some sort of crime that they could let it later prosecute for. And, you know, the government recently has begun prosecuting uh, for actions that have occurred um, not only in Nevada, but later at the Malheur um, National Wildlife Refuge in, in Oregon. And, you know, the, the, the extent of the documentary or the fake documentary was, was enormous. I mean, they spent nearly a year. They would have invested, you know, possibly millions of dollars in FBI time and resources. To, to make this documentary film. And so this obviously raises a number of really concerning issues about the government posing as journalists and the chilling effect that that has on um, real journalists' ability to, to do their work. Um, but what, 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 is, what was interesting for us is that we had you know, more, this more than 100 hours of footage, and we also had video and audio of the agents kind of talking among themselves and you know, accidentally taking you know, video of themselves and the, the lead filmmaker, the lead undercover agent, was a man named Charles Johnson, and we had, you know, his face on video. And so, you know, to be honest, we were just curious what would happen if we Googled Charles Johnson FBI. And it turned out that there was this story by one of the local um, Denver news, television news stations about this suspicious guy 
who was going around in Glendale, knocking on doors. Me, if I could interrupt, if, was, I, if I could interrupt, sure. apologies. That's, you know, my colleague Chuck Bonnewell is here. That's his wife, Julie Hayden. Uh, Julie, okay. Just, so just us tying some things together. Julie and Chuck do a Saturday morning show here on 710K in U.S. He's sitting with us now. But Julie, who is an excellent, excellent, excellent investigative reporter, that was her story that you saw that triggered this, and that ties back into some other things. So just FYI, so if you know Trevor again, please. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. I didn't mean to leave out credit Sorry, for, no, for please, the reporter. Please. Yeah, um, yeah, so we, we came across this story, and um, the, the uh, Julie's report had a picture of um, – of Charles, and it, it looked pretty close to the video that we had of um, uh, of, the, of the undercover video from the fake documentary. And so we requested from Glendale Police the police report, as well as um, video and audio that had been taken. You know, the video that they had was an interrogation video. And, and what was interesting was in the police report, there was uh, Charles Johnson's business card um, that he had distributed in Glendale. And this included, um, a, you know, the, the card was a very, you know, basically designed one that said he was an investigative consultant. But, you know, the confirmation for us came when we saw on the business card that he listed the same address Mm. and phone number that he had when he was posing as a documentary filmmaker in Nevada. In in Nevada, he was claiming to be with a company called Longbow Productions, and it had a Nashville, Tennessee address. And the address that he listed on his investigative consultant card that he was passing around to – uh, to people in Glendale, showed the same address and phone number. Yep. So at that point, it was clear that um, you know this Charles uh, was an FBI agent, and this was the same guy who had infiltrated the Bundys for this fake documentary. Um, and so then it just became for us an interesting hmm. um, kind of um, footnote to our larger story because what was interesting is even after he finished pretending to be a journalist in the in the undercover Bundy investigation, he had investigated. Um, this strange case in, in Colorado, whose um, the objectives we don't fully understand, um, but you know, had also pretended to be a journalist in, in a roundabout way, but you know, was sloppy enough to you know get himself arrested by you know Glendale police for you know you know pretending to or for for, for practicing its private investigation without a state license. I'm going to jump over to Chuck for a moment. Um, if you're just joining us, this is again one of those stories that the Denver Post won't do, and nobody else is capable. The Chronicle does. We do. Great guest, Trevor, uh, Aaron, or, excuse me, Aronson on the sh- on the line who did the work. Uh, so enter the dragon. This guy comes here, and how do you hook in? And I think we, the morning show on 710 gets pulled into this thing, and I talked about when we saw that guy taking our pictures. Uh, Trevor, you and I have never spoken, but that got real weird here. Chuck, if you would. Yeah, I mean, I know why Charles Johnson was here, and I guess I'll tell you why. Charles Johnson was was here, um, but as a practical matter, I, I read Trevor's thing on the Intercept and I thought it was very good and very well done. Um, but that is not an obscure reason why Charles Johnson was here. Um, but as a, as as a practical matter, it's interesting because he was carrying, according to Trevor's one, expensive camera equipment, um, which is you know <laughs> he's he's going all and and we so saw it. yeah we we saw it we saw some of it uh, because there was a car that was outside of our offices um, and the guy pretending he was homeless with expensive camera um, noting everybody who came in and everyone who went out and you were there for yeah. a day we were filming a report and one of the camera women kind of went wait a minute yeah. who's that guy in the car yeah. uh, with the, you know the camera so we went over confronted him and he, he you it was know bizarre. it was bizarre he, talked he threatened about, us and, he threatened us and you, you know all these command uh, stay away from the car stand Do not, back from the vehicle, vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. The vehicle. command he had a command voice he had a command voice and then on air uh, peter called uh, the uh, mm. the phone number that charles johnson gave and talked to his mm. uh, well when his it's reception a it's a mail drop. Yeah, it's a mail drop, and and she was talking about Charles Johnson. Um, Trevor, I don't know if you ever heard that audio. Um, no, I, I just so this 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 is this part is news to me. I didn't know if you had previously talked to him on the radio. Well, I not never, him, not, but, not to him. But there was okay. a woman. It's a mail drop, and she was very lovely, and she answered the phone, and I quickly identified who I was on air live, and and uh, she rolled into. Well, no, it's a, you know, do you ever see him and. <laughs> You know, it's it's a mail drop, and she they it's one of those places they pretend you have an office, right? And right. that was Longbow right. Productions yeah. too. Long, it's, 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 absolutely, it was all part of that. It was all part of that one. And uh, and then the other side of this, which is really, I have the pictures. Uh, we were shooting a piece for Fox News, 
and uh, they're called shooters, obviously. The, the camera person, this young woman, works for Julie, and she said, look over there, this guy's taking our pictures. The guy was in a beat-to-dog Subaru. Right. right? On, 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 it's so, such a crazy story that I have to say, you know, on my grandson, and he had blacked out all the windows with, with tape. trash bags. Right. Black trash bags. Pretended he was homeless, just a homeless and, guy. And, Trev, this guy had a camera. And oh. Equipment. I mean, I don't know much about much, but I can tell you this: the guy, you know, it was it was a really, really expensive camera. And coming back to your point, that Johnson pretends to be a documentary filmmaker, and he has pr- pretty good equipment with him on on that job, correct? Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, they they, they had professional grade stuff. I mean, you oh, yeah. would, this guy did on their equipment alone. You think that they were a real film crew? And so we traced him back his plate. And it goes his car, and I've never understood this, where how you can register a car to a homeless shelter. But, again, if I'm lying, I'm flying. Where was the car registered to? I think it was a, it was a hotel that had homeless yeah. people. Okay, better yet. Yeah. Yeah. I take nah. it back. Yeah. But can you register a, a car to a hotel? No, it was, it was clearly done for him. Yeah. You know, he pretends he's a homeless guy. Yeah, yeah it, was, no. it was the cover. He was, he was taking our picture. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I have pictures of him. Yeah, I right. went up to the well, car. Uh, right, you could probably check him against yeah. your FBI up, file. No, I went up, you know, looking in the window. Hey, right. man, you know, <laughs> get back from the car, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now we're well, rolling. Let me, ask, yeah. <laughs> let me ask you, Chuck. You know, I, I um, you know, certainly, I, I pushed the article as, as much as I could from the facts that I, I could, uh, I could verify. But you know, as far as what he was investigating, I certainly have some ideas based on what he was doing. But I was curious. You know, you had mentioned that you felt like you, you had a you were confident you knew what he was investigating, and I was curious if you could you talk about that a little bit. Sure. The FBI and a man who you cite in your article, Muhammad Ali Erhaki, um, are in bed together. They've been in bed together for years. Um, it is not clear whether Muhammad Ali Erhaki is a double or triple agent or what exactly is. He has extensive contacts in Iran. He has extensive contacts with Iranian government officials. When his father-in-law died and they had a a kind of a ceremony uh, at, at Infinity Park. There were people from the Khomeini government there, uh, very conspicuous <laughs> in uh, how they dressed and how they acted. Um, but anybody who comes up against Muhammad er- Ali Erhaki, and he was the one who was going to redevelop the land, um, and he accused the city of Glendale of wanting, wanting the land, which they did, uh, but they said, if you don't want to sell it to us, then you don't want to sell it to us. But that wasn't enough. Our paper covered the story, and we covered lots of stories about developers wanting to be, build huge high-rises on parks at churches and everything else. And since we're a neighborhood newspaper, we generally are, are favorable to the neighborhoods. Um, but if you do anything that Muhammad er- Ali Erhaki doesn't like, you get FBI agents on you. It's amazing. It's just Amazing. And I mean, I've, I've had this conversation, Trevor, with Chuck numbers of times privately. Do you think, as they say in the street, that they dropped a dime on us? Do you think that we were that we were pointed out, these guys are a pain in my rear end. These guys are giving me problems. Why else would, if we, if his name's Charles Johnson... Why else did Charles come to town, or why did Charles come? Yeah, to town? Charles went to two groups of people. One, anybody quoted in the newspaper no. who was who was critical of his development, and it was the intention of Air Hockey and the FBI to shut off everybody no. who would say anything critical. He succeeded because they went to their businesses, they harassed people with their homes, they did everything in the world to shut down any criticism of Muhammad. Uh, Ali Air Hockey. They did, and, and it was successful. Right. All of a sudden, you're at work, and the guy says, I'm a private investigator. Mm-hmm. I need to talk to your employee on an important matter. Bring him out to me, et cetera, et cetera. It shut off all conversation. Mm-hmm. Anybody who was critical of Muhammad Ali Air Hockey ceased being critical. Remember, we found out in reports they were listening to the radio show. Well, this is the best this, part about it. It's part, part this two. Is true, yeah. When people, because, because Charles Johnson intimidated people, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they were coming to their home mm-hmm. late at night into businesses. Mm-hmm. So they filed police reports in Glendale and Lakewood. Mm. Anyone who filed a complaint against Genshaw then got somebody who den- did identify themselves as an FBI oh, indeed. agent indeed. and demanded an interview with him. Yeah. No, so these people are now terrified of either going to local law enforcement yeah. against anything or against one of the agents. I mean, the whole city has true. become terrified of Muhammad Ali Air Hockey and the FBI, and, and the two of them work together. In fact, one businessman, we're working on this story, apparently – 
his his lead FBI agent is a guy named Johnny Grusing, mm-hmm. and you, you may remember Johnny Grusing from the Scott Lee Kimball massacres. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was he was an FBI agent who purportedly uh, helped uh, expose uh, Scott Lee Kimball, who was in fact himself an FBI agent. Yeah, right. Other people think he was the cleaner for it, mm-hmm. but but Grusing apparently Grusing and another businessman Glendale shook down people to wear wires. They said, I want you to wear a wire for Mm -hmm. me and then go into Glendale City Hall. There's another quote-unquote Chinese businessman who came to Glendale City Hall, and he started offering... Uh, you know, veiled bribery mm-hmm. offers. Money. What can I do for you, sir? Yeah, right. I know. I forget about the project. What can I do for you? Mm-hmm. And, every, and he has to be also have been an FBI agent. Um, and so this this weird mixture of Muhammad Ali Air Hockey, his development, he wants to build the big building against all zoning codes and everything else. And in fact, the FBI, who has really terrified the whole town. I mean, you you do not criticize, and I suggest you do not criticize Muhammad Ali or hockey. Or you'll get well. You're probably already in trouble with the FBI, uh, Trevor. But but it's what's <laughs> gonna say? Yeah, you're already on the but, on the bad list. You know, we were just talking before the before the turn, and you came on the show. Take that Nietzsche in re- approach to don't tell me who likes you, tell me who doesn't like you, and I will know who you are. And um, they they we saw reports that, and I I made the the wise ass remark on the radio show, why don't you give me a call? I mean, I'll talk to you. I right. mean, you're mm. you know, feds and we can do it live on the air. You can right. inter- interview me live on the air. The interesting thing was the agent in charge. What happened to that agent? He, get, he got sent back to Washington, D.C. in, got, in a Trev, windowless room. He, Trev, you know, I don't know if you knew that, but they, <laughs> when, we, when we started doing the story, they got him out of Dodge. He also had sexual harassment complaints. Yeah, he had some issues. Yeah. Him and Roger Ailes. Yeah. <laughs> Trevor, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, Chuck Bonnewell in studio. Trevor Aronson, I think this is one of those stories. We always make jokes that Chuck's wife will no longer have lunch with us because we're being surveilled by the FBI. On the line with us is Trevor Aronson in studio, my colleague and my friend Chuck Bonnewell, morning show host on Saturday mornings with Julie Hayden here on 710. This piece, how an undercover FBI agent ended up in jail after pretending to be a journalist. I asked Chuck this off the air, and I said this is what I was going to ask you both. Trevor, I can lead with you. Boil it all down. There's a lot of this, that, and sidebars and tracks. What is this really all about? You know, I think Chuck, as he was saying, can, can speak to kind of, you know, the more of the local issue of what, um, of, of what, of what the FBI was up to with the, with the real estate developments. I mean, I think, you know, and I think that's a, that's a part of it. I think the other part of it is, and, and the kind of larger national story is the FBI's willingness to pose as journalists for um, the purposes of furthering criminal investigation or, or whatever their ultimate objective is. And I think, you know, at this time now, there's, there's this great kind of, to a certain extent, lionization happening with James Comey, given the investigations in, in Washington. And I think it's really important to remember that the FBI under Comey, you know, did a lot of underhanded things. And, and one of the things that they, they appear to have done more and more is, is pose as journalists um, to further criminal investigations. And when uh, this was first exposed a few years ago, James Comey had described it in a letter to The New York Times as being something that's very rare. And what we know is that one of the occasions that they used it for was in trying to identify a teenager who was sending email bomb threats to his high school, causing daily evacuations of the high school. In, in that particular case, the FBI posed as um, employees of the Associated Press, sent an email to the, the bomb threat maker and um, got him to click on a link that, that essentially um, surreptitiously, surreptitiously installed the tracking software that allowed the FBI to catch them. And in the FBI's view, this, this extraordinary cover using a journalistic cover was necessary because this was a public safety issue, and in the FBI's view, it justified the use of this extraordinary cover. But what we see in the in the undercover investigation of the Bundys, um, where they pose as documentary filmmakers, and certainly, you know, this case in Colorado where Charles Johnson posed as someone who he claims was hired by a journalist, you know, it's clear that the FBI is using a journalistic cover for cases that are not kind of urgent in public safety. And I think this, this creates a real question of whether the FBI should be doing this. I mean, certainly it's not illegal, it's not unconstitutional, but it raises a lot of questions about whether the FBI, um, this FBI practice has a larger chilling effect on, on journalists and their ability to gather information. Because, you know, if we're doing, if the FBI does a lot of these, these exercises, these, these undercover activities, you know, people will begin the question when people like 
like me or, or like Chuck or you call someone and ask for an interview because the question that will be in the back of their head is, well, is this person really a journalist or is this person, you know, a mole for the government or an undercover yeah, agent? And I think that's a real chilling effect. Chuck, what was it about? What's this? I mean, here's Johnson, like like Trevor writes, he gets popped here. He's carrying three different state identif- identification cards. He's got Tennessee. He's got Hawaii. He's got Florida. Th- those used to be called get out of jail free cards is what they used to call those right. when mm-hmm. they did black bag jobs and all this stuff in the right. 60s and right. 40s and 30s and so what said and done what was this all about well you know you'll never know for sure one of the interesting things is that charles johnson has also been accused of pretending he was a militia member mm-hmm. um and you may remember that mahamali air hockey got a whole group of what he called oath keepers to march on city hall and swear and intimidate minority people from coming in city hall uh, to oppose uh, Muhammad Ali Air Hockey's uh, proposal, um, and and it's it's amazing. I've had oath keepers who a lot of them are listeners to your show, and that wasn't us. So who was it? If guys pretending to be oath keepers, uh, threatening people and everything else, um, who were they? Were they FBI agents? Were they FBI informants? Were they FBI? Who were they? Um, and so a lot of these, what Trevor is talking to, a lot of these tactics. Uh, and we don't know what all the tactics are, are very strange. I mean, I, sh- I assume the FBI could claim Islamophobia uh, because Muhammad Ali Air Hockey wasn't getting his, his – he didn't ever actually have a proposal, but, but his vague intonation of what he wanted. Um, and, you know, at the time, Loretta Lynch uh, was, was hot on the thing of Islamophobia, oh, yeah. so maybe they could put it under that one. Okay, well, you know, if you don't give what Muhammad Ali Air Hockey wants, that's Islamophobia. Islamophobia, but what is scary about the whole thing is is that you really do not know what the yeah. FBI is doing. What was, you know, it, what was accomplished? It, well, you know what was accomplished. It, it was pretty good. Everybody's terrified of criticizing Muhammad Ali Air Hockey for fear yeah. that the FBI, either in form of phony agents or real agents, will come to your home yeah. or your house. And they, they did. succeeded. And they they did. succeeded in terrorizing yeah. an entire town. And, and in order for one guy who is either a double, maybe a triple agent, who knows what Muhammad Ali or hockey really is. So it was a successful campaign. If the FBI was doing there to shut any criticism down of the guy they're in bed with, they succeeded. They succeeded. Trevor, when the expose began in the Chronicle, and we did a lot of stuff on the radio show, and it was a weird time. I mean, I honestly believe it was very strange. Uh, we found out, and I thought it was no big deal. Listen to the radio show. I'm glad. I hope you got a machine. You know, yeah. <laughs> I hope you got a meter, mm-hmm. but um, you know, I, I thought it was odd, and um, it turns up we read some documents that they were listening, and and I don't know if is what the purpose of all of that was. You know, you can't do this job and be afraid. So Johnson pretends to be a documentary filmmaker, pretends to be an investigative reporter, pretends to be a militia man. And you have to understand how great lengths they went at the trial oh, no, yeah, of, the, of, of the last trial of hiding Charles Johnson. They had a special entrance Where, where is he now? Where, well, right. prob- probably in Nashville. But, but he, he had a special entrance. You could, so you couldn't no, see no, him. I know. No I phones know. were allowed in the courtroom. Yeah. They did everything to hide oh, okay. his, his identity. Yeah. And all they had to do was similar uh, to what Trevor did, go yeah. online, go Charles Johnson, FBI agent, mm-hmm. pops up. Julie's story pops up our yeah. story. Oh, yeah. And, and, of course, they've got these huge Giglio problems. Mm-hmm. And people don't know he's, he's a Giglio impeached witness. And if, you, if you're a federal, federal employee and you're going to give testimony, the agency is supposed to provide the prosecutors anything that would, would tarnish your credibility. Well, it's clear they didn't do that. They did not provide Charles Johnson. Because Charles Johnson has been arrested in Glendale. Oh, yeah. He ha- now has a cease and desist order uh, by the uh, Department of Regulatory Agencies. Yeah. I bet you not one of that was reported to the prosecutors, or the prosecutors did not pass it on the defense. So if, if yeah, I was I, a, go ahead, Trevor. Yeah, I mean, I, I can add to that. I, I did ask the FBI and and DOJ if um, if they had provided that material as as as, as Giglio, um, and they, they did not respond to that in our questions. But I also talked to um, Clive and Bundy, Bundy's lawyer, and lawyers for the other defendants, and they all. Um, acknowledged that that information had not been turned over to them. Right. In fact, they, they were unaware at that point of Johnson's arrest in, in Colorado and, and agreed with Chuck, and, and I agree with this as well. I mean, that is clearly Giglio material um, information that would otherwise impeach a witness. And so we've already seen Charles Johnson testify in, in one of the trials, and, you know, the defense lawyers in that trial did not have this information. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you can make a pretty strong argument that the, the government violated Giglio in, in this case. 
Yeah, uh, and it's being retried because there was a hung jury uh, in one he testified to, although some of the one, the one guy that did convict, although not of the conspiracy charge, was who else? A former FBI informant who was the most vicious of all of them. Brillison. Right. Yeah, right. Right. If you just joined us, the piece is how an undercover FBI agent ended up in jail after pretending to be a journalist that focuses here in Glendale, Colorado. Uh, our online with us is he's investigative reporter Trevor Aronson, Chuck Bonawell, my colleague and friend in studio. And it focused on very tiny Glendale, as uh, as Trevor said. How long do you think the feds, well, they? how long was the standoff between the Bundys and the FBI or the Bureau of Land Management? That happened in 2014. How long How long did that last, Trevor? I, I mean, it, it, from when it first started and, and um, Cliven started, started getting attention through the media, I mean, the whole process of rounding up the cattle and then finally the, the withdrawal was about a month. But really it, was, it, it reached a kind of fever pitch at the end in that final week because Charles John, or excuse me, um, Cliven Bundy had, had attracted so many um, people to his cause and so many armed people to no, his people cause. People showed up. That's that right. A, no, they did. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, 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 FBI, the FBI and um, BLM had a real concern that, you know, this was a possible kind of ruby ridge in the make, and um, yeah, that was a big yeah, reason absolutely. that they, they withdrew, they withdrew, yeah. No, I mean, I, I was, I went to the Freeman standoff and did the radio show up there during the free From Montana. In Montana, and um, Garfield County. And uh, it was in the aftermath of, of Ruby Waco Ridge, yeah. and Ruby, Ruby Ridge, Ridge and, yeah. and and so everybody's on edge. And I saw some of that stuff, and it was really fascinating. But then everybody thought that went to ground, and then it pops up again. And um, so I'm going to pose a question for both of you guys when we come back. Um, who is Charles Johnson? What was his role? And what was the FBI doing? Uh, in some of the stuff, like in the, in the Bundy case, that's pretty much SOP for the FBI to be doing that. On the other hand, this guy is not Donnie Brasco. You know, this guy's not Joe Pistone. What was he doing in Glendale? And he's, and there are people they call, or I've read they call these people, they do black bag jobs. And they work for the FBI, but they're not agents. He's an agent. He's an agent. He is an agent. Without a yeah, doubt. Yes. Okay. That's not his real name. Uh, they, they, in the court filings, a... they said, no, this is a FBI agent. So he's a badge guy. He's got credentials. He's got credentials. Because remember, and I, because I'm an old guy, in the 60s, they would have people called snitches. And they were called agents provocateurs. They did, they did the black right. bag. Right. And they, the FBI had them. Well, that was Scott, and, that's Scott Lee Kimball who murdered five to 17 exactly. people. And, and it's also in Boston... Yeah, Whitey Bulger. Whitey Bulger. Yes. Whitey was their boy. Right. Well, we, you, you, you know, you, you peel back. That's um, my point. And my you question. peel back, you know, what, what yeah. there's a reason why yeah. the FBI likes to do everything in secrecy yeah. and never wants to respond to questions yeah. and never uh, does a thing that says we can respond to that. They, yeah. they just told Trevor this is normal thing. We yeah. won't tell you. We won't. Yeah. They operate in secret. And people who operate oh, yeah. in secret sometimes oh. sometimes yeah. do bad things and they, and they get away with it by keeping it secret. Now, Trevor's picture looks like a young guy. But in the 60s, in the anti-war movement in this country, they infiltrated and they would go to meetings and tell people, go to Wyoming and buy, buy dynamite. And they said all kinds of insane things. Well, these, Pam Geller, they were following, yeah. they were saying, light up Texas. Remember that? Same Light thing. up Texas. And we found out what happened with Robert Spencer right. when they're in a the car behind the killers at yes. Waco, 60 Minutes. Everybody sit still. Uh, Trev, hang on, please. 303-696-1971. Let's turn around, come back, and do the market updates. And then lost, uh, the excuse me, the lost order, the Knights. Hang on. Um, excuse me, Aronson is online. By the way, when we're done, please send me a copy of your book, Chuck Off Air is telling me that you caught this thing and you know exactly what you're talking about. So I'd love to be able to read the book and have you back as a guest. Plus, we need to continue with the story as well. So uh, during right before the pause, we're talking about what was focused in Glendale and an undercover FBI agent identifying himself as Charles Johnson. I play on the edges of this as uh, Trevor Wright starts knocking on doors and asking questions. Uh, we'll start with Trevor. Trevor, Knocking on doors in Little Glendale, Colorado. What questions was he asking, and why? No, I mean that, that was that was the curious thing. I mean, it, it was clear from the questions that he was asking, at least according to the police report, and you know the people I called who he had contacted. Um, you know, this was not a clear um, matter of criminal investigation from what he was asking. I mean, he was asking 
bizarrely, um, you know, to talk to people who had been quoted as opposing the the land development um, in in Chuck's newspaper. So people that that Chuck's reporters had quoted as as um, opposing the the um, land development that Glendale 180 was on the land Glendale 180 was hoping to purchase were being contacted by this reporter. Excuse me, not this reporter. This investigator who claimed to be you know hired by a reporter. And um, he just he said he just wanted to talk to them, and so that was that was really strange because obviously there is no crime in you know being quoted in your local newspaper opposing some sort of um, civic action or some sort of development, and um, you know unless you know, and it could be a situation that Chuck was describing that it was some sort of intimidation. It could be that they were interested in some sort of collusion or public corruption. I mean, it was all very unclear. But you know, it, to me, it was highly unusual that he'd be asking these types of questions. And it was also highly unusual the way that he behaved. Um, you know, I, um, a number of former FBI agents um, talk to me, and I, I go to them as background sources and trying to help me understand FBI policy and, and the actions of FBI agents. And I, I talked to a, a few of them about this because I felt like it was so curious. And, you know, one of the things that all of them said to me was that, you know, the, the way Charles Johnson behaved and the way he asked questions was not consistent with their understanding of most undercover FBI investigations. So, you know, one red flag for them was that he um, had three different identifications on him from Tennessee, mm-hmm. Hawaii, and um, uh, uh, and Florida, I believe was the third one. Yes. And, you know, that was against protocol. If you're acting undercover and you have multiple cover IDs, you would never carry all of them at the same time. And the other was allowing himself to get arrested in the way that he did. I mean, that's just you know, that's something that FBI agents are never supposed to allow to have happen. And so there was speculation among the former FBI agents I talked to that mm. maybe he was acting on his own, that he wasn't working in an official mm. FBI capacity. But, but what, we, we've since, what we since now know from the FBI's responses to us, as well as to uh, Julie's report and to Chuck's newspaper, I mean, this was clearly um, official FBI activity, even if it was incredibly sloppy and incredibly questionable. One of the questions I always have when this ended, having been a geek reader for the 60s, when they use these characters, either real feds or the black bag guys, they carried with them get-out-of-jail-free cards. That's what they were called. Well, Charles Johnson got one. Yeah, he did. And that's my point, sure. which, if you would, please. Well, you know, he, he was arrested on a misdemeanor. They could have charged him with a lot more with the fake IDs and multiple states. You're not supposed to have those. But they get, you know, said, no, let's just do the, the – simply didn't have the license. Um, and then the FBI went to George Brockler, who we both know we there, love, yeah, yeah Arapo County DA, and said, we want all the charges dismissed. And I yeah. said, why? And they said, we can't tell you. And he yeah. said, well, I'm I can't not, then. Uh, well, yeah. he, no, he said, I'm not going to do it surreptitiously. I'm not going to do it saying, well, we just didn't want to prosecute. You send me a letter. So they yeah. sent him a letter, and then George attached it to his motion to dismiss to the court, asking the court to dismiss the charges per the FBI. Well, the FBI, I'm told, was outraged. They were, they want now That's George Brockler's on their on sure. their on their get because they exposed their scheme. Right mm-hmm. now, here's a letter from the from the special agent in charge of the Denver office saying, "Release this guy." The get which, out of jail free card. Get out of jail free card, yeah. which exposed that he really was not just as most of us assumed he w- was working for for Muhammad Ali or hockey in some he capacity, was actually, yeah, and he was actually an, either an FBI informant or an FBI agent. And your best guess, both of you guys, is was. As they say, he had a shield. He was an agent. No, he was. It's clear yeah. he was. There's no yeah. question that he's an FBI agent because he's he's identified such in in the in the Bundy trials in Nevada. Um, that yes, is an FBI agent. No, his real name is not Charles Johnson. And no, you can't ask him about any other investigations or anything else he's doing. Conclusions. Yeah, of what, he, I'm sorry, Trav. Go ahead. I apologize. Yeah. No, I, I would just add in, he, in, in in his testimony in the Bundy trial as well. He acknowledged. I think he said he'd been with the FBI. For 17 years, and before that, had been a local police officer. So, yeah, it's definitely on the record that he is a he is a he is an agent with a badge. The bank shot on this is Robert Spencer, Pam Geller in Texas, when we know they're in the car behind the killers. Amazing. I mean, and there's pictures. And, and so then they flee. Then he flees. And he runs. Runs. Once runs. they start gunning for the the, the but, poor local law enforcement people, who's in a gunfight. In a gunfight, they and, just flee. And they're probably armed, and they won't help out local law enforcement fight these two jihadis. I tell you what, I mean, this is how we sort of began with this. Trevor, I want to have you back, and Chuck, obviously. Um, Faith and trust is important anybody has in a federal institution. I don't know after, well, using Edgar Hoover, but moving through Nixon and moving through... Oh, Patrick Gray. Pat Gray, and that 
moment I've talked about many times where Hoover's gone and Nixon appoints Patrick Gray, who walks out in the hallway and says, there are no secret files. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, the, well, the secretary, yeah, yeah. Hoover's secretary is uh, yeah. bailing them out. Right. But do you have a con- you have a part of a conclusion at all, Trevor, to the audience about this whole thing? I mean, I, I guess I would say, you know, I mean, this this is a clear example of kind of the investigative, the, inve- the expanding investigative and surveillance powers of the FBI. I mean, I guess one thing that I would leave your audience with is that, you know, obviously throughout the FBI's history, there has been a, uh, um, uh, stories of, oh. of abuse of power oh. and surveillance. But but what we're seeing now, kind of post 9/11, at this kind of intersection of national security and civil liberties, is that you know the, the investigative powers of the FBI have expanded to a great oh. degree. Yeah. Um, you know, under the FBI's current assessment process, they don't even need to to believe or have a criminal predicate. They don't even need to believe that you're associating with criminals or involved in criminal activity. For 72 hours, they can investigate and surveil you. And so, you know, I, I think one of the things that people don't pay enough attention to is that, you know, the FBI has continued to expand its authority um, to, you know, in, in very intrusive ways. And so, you know, its intentions may be great. Its intentions may be to stop the next attack or to root out political corruption or public corruption. But at the same time, you know, these, these powers are easily abused as, oh. you know, the FBI's you know, 100-year history clearly shows. Well, we're watching right yeah. now with James Comey. He has associates reading memos to Washington Post reporters. Yeah. I mean, F, those are FBI people identified as FBI agents reading partial memorandums of, prepared by James Comey. You know, what kind of FBI do you have when that's what they're doing? Well, and I come back full circle, um, back to the misuse of the CIA for years, uh, the misuse of the FBI for years, and then I think if somebody has at least room temperature IQ, they realize, and Trevor, this is where we began, these people manufactured a war. They lied and made up a war. They used the CIA to do it. They used the feds to do it. And all of that stuff was served up, I believe, to Dick Cheney, and uh, it was then turned into the biggest foreign policy mistake in the country's history. And not mistake, it was a lie. Uh, Neil Sheehan called other things bright, shining lies. I think it comes close. Trevor, what I'd love to do is put you on hold. You'll speak to Casey, send the book, and I'll get you back. Uh, it's a great book, honestly. Yeah, I you really I want to read Inside it. Inside the Terror Factory. Yeah. I'd really highly recommend well, it. So can we do that? And I know there'll be a follow-up. We'll do it again. Trevor, thank you for your time this morning. You made the whole week work, but thank you for your time and your good work. Of course, yeah. Thanks for having me. You're on hold, uh, Chuck. You got to cut some promos. We come back on the other side about the Knights of the Golden Circle. I love this stuff.